Well, hello and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily. I am Mike, the product manager of Dragonfly at ORS, and you can follow me at Dragonfly Wizard on Twitter. So uh, be sure and check out our YouTube videos. You can visit our YouTube playlist at orss.ca slash ytp2 and catch this video and other videos. Of course, if you are watching live, then you benefit from being able to ask questions during the question and answer session. So thank you for attending. If you are watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and give us a like on this video so we know that you're interested in image segmentation and related topics. That is the topic for today, Lesson 26, Histographic Segmentation. As always, we will be using Dragonfly 4.1, the slightly customized edition or slightly customized uh, version of Dragonfly that we've done with Lesson 6, Customizing Dragonfly. Histographic segmentation is a tool for performing image segmentation. It's used by and large by material scientists or geoscientists. I would say that it doesn't have much utility for most biological applications, but we'll have a look at it today and you can make a decision for yourself. So histographic segmentation, we're going to look at an image, but instead of looking at just the image intensity, we're going to create a two signal scatter plot. Now it can be any two signals. It could be the signal from two different images. So if you've captured a backscatter and a secondary electron or a low energy and a high energy micro CT scan, you could use that. However, the two signals we will look at today will be the image intensity, that is every pixel in your image has some intensity, and we'll also look at the edge intensity. We'll look at your image after it's been filtered with a Sobel filter. This will give us two uh, different pieces of information. The image intensity does not have any spatial information, it's just how bright or dark is a pixel. The edge intensity does have spatial information encoded. The closer you are to an edge or an interface between two different phases or materials, you'll have a brighter intensity. So image intensity is based on pure physics, so it might be x-ray attenuation or backscatter in the electron microscope, whereas edge intensity is going to be based on distance from an interface. We'll see that we can use the histographic segmentation tools to paint in the histogram domain. You'll see what I mean. I'm also dilate in the histogram domain, but you'll see that you can also paint in the image domain and then ultimately expand with a watershed transform in the image domain. So this is probably one of the easiest ways to apply a watershed transform for a full image segmentation in Dragon fly. Now, a quick note, after we cover today's topic, histographic segmentation, we will, as always, have questions and answers. But if you stick around after that, I would like to discuss a collaboration opportunity for bone imaging scientists. It won't involve much work on your part, but I think it'll be a nice paper that you would like to be a part of. So please stick around. If you are a bone imaging scientist, stick around after the questions and answers so we can have a brief discussion. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, you won't see that part of the discussion, but you can always email collaborate at theobjects.com, and that way you can uh, get information and more information about collaborations with us. Now let's pop over to Dragonfly. The data set we are going to use today comes off the Digital Rocks portal. Maybe I should open up a web page and show it to you. Let's uh, pop open a web page and digital rocks portal not trying to play favorites but this is a great uh, repository where lots of different researchers have deposited data that is just useful for imaging scientists to play around and experiment uh, although the website seems to be a little bit slow today still waiting for it to open well um I'll tell you the data set we're using. It is a uh, Bentheimer after a water flood, and uh, I believe the data is contributed by Equinor. If the project comes back up, ah, here we are. So I'll do a search for water flood, and we actually see a few different samples here. And let's see, water flood, where is, ah, oh, my search is not working at all. Let's browse through it quickly and see if I can point out the data set so that you can get it for yourself as well. All right, not there. <laughs> Still don't see it. So much rich data in this resource. Maybe I should search for Bentheimer, although uh, here we are. So uh, there are four different data sets, five different data sets in a row in this index Bentheimer. This is the one uh, contributed by Thomas Ramstad from Equinor. And we're just using, I believe, this one, the water flooded data set. So you can grab this raw data, which is 16 bit unsigned with matrix dimension 601 by 594 by 1311 at seven, mi seven micron voxel size. Now let's minimize this. Hopefully we can 
see. Oh, let's get the captions going again. And hopefully we can see the captions when we're in Dragonfly. Now I have already put this into my organizer and I'm just gonna grab the data um, from the organizer. I'm also gonna grab a Sobel 3D filtered. We are gonna filter it during this exercise, but I wanna be able to look at the data, look at the filtered data uh, for a minute with you as well. Now uh, we'll look at this data. I can double click to go full screen. I can adjust my brightness and contrast. And what we see here is multiple phases. I have a rock matrix, which is probably some quartz based or some uh, uh, siliclastic rock grain matrix. And we have a pore space. Now the pore space here is not just dark, but it's also this bright phase. So I have not read the paper. I don't know the details of this experiment, but it's not uncommon to have a rock that is saturated with a fluid and then to do an imbibition or drainage experiment where you pump in a fluid another fluid, and in this case, the other fluid is stained with some high X-ray attenuation stain, so it becomes much brighter. So the pore space is all of the black pixels and all of the bright pixels. It's just that the spots that are maybe water wet may be surrounded by black voxels, and the spots that are oil wet may be surrounded by white voxels. The important thing here is there is a pore phase in black and white, and then there's a grain phase. But of course, there are three phases here, the rock, the high, att high attenuation fluid, and the low attenuation fluid. So we'd like to do a three phase segmentation. So we can look at the data and it's a little bit noisy, but that's just the nature of micro CT. We do have some ring artifacts, but no big deal. Now we can look over here at the histogram and what we would like to see are three phases or three broad peaks. Actually, what we really want to see are three narrow peaks. Now, if I zoom in on this histogram a little bit, we do in fact see three peaks. We see this peak over here or this shoulder on this peak, which is the dark pore phase. And then uh, if we look here, that is the matrix phase. And then if we look at its shoulder, not very well resolved in the histogram is the bright phase there. So if we tried to do histographic segmentation, that is one dimensional segment segmentation, just based on intensity, then we're gonna have some overlap in these different phases. So rather than doing a segmentation where we're trying to uh, segment based on uh, just this one intensity, we couldn't consider segmenting by two signals simultaneously. Now, what I'm gonna show you now is the Sobel image of this. So. I use the image processing toolbox and I'm just gonna adjust the brightness and contrast. And so what you see here are the edges in the image. Now the brightest edges are the edges that are an interface between black pixels and uh, bright pixels because there's a bigger contrast. And I just turned off the visibility because I needed to adjust the brightness back here. So you'll have a very bright edge here and a, a less bright edge here and an even less bright edge between the white and the gray. So if we turn this on, we can sort of see that these edges are a little bit muddy, these edges are brighter, but that's the Sobel image. Now I can also, if I want to, I can turn on the alpha here. So now I'm looking at the edge map, the Sobel map sort of superimposed. And what we see here is we have, of course, pixels of the rock matrix, pixels of the dark pore space, pixels of the bright pore space, and then we have pixels that are near an edge boundary. So if I were to do a probe, I can turn on probe, and if I look in here, now what we have over here, there's a lot of data in this, in this, but let's uh, let's look closely at it. So for the water flooded data set, if I'm here in these black pixels, the intensity is around 6,000. If I'm here in these grain pixels, the intensity is around 8,500. And if I'm here in the bright pore pixels, it's around 11,400. Now the Sobel image, if I'm in the middle of a black pore space, I may have an intensity you know, of uh, 50 to 200. If I'm in the middle of a, uh, the middle of the grain space, it's also 50 to 200. If I'm up here, also 50 to 200. But as I approach the interface, we see the Sobel goes up. So there are two axes of information here. There is how close am I to an edge and there is what phase am I in? And so for each pixel, you could answer those two questions. What phase am I in? And how close am I to an edge? What we would like to do is perform a segmentation of the high confidence pixels. And those are gonna be the pixels that are in the middle of the pore that are far away from an edge. 
If we segment the high confidence pixels, that is the ones that have low Sobel intensity, then we'll end up labeling all the pixels in the middle of the pore, labeling all the pixels in the middle of the grain, labeling all the pixels in the middle of the high intensity pore. Then what we could do is use a watershed expansion to expand these pixels towards this edge, these pixels towards this edge, and then they would converge on the frontier. That sort of watershed expansion, we haven't talked about it before, but that's a watershed transform, usually using something like the Sobel or an edge intensity map as a landscape function. So we don't have time to cover the watershed transform here. You could Google it or look at some YouTube videos, or we could have a, a deeper discussion about watershed later. So what we will fundamentally be doing is segmenting the high confidence pixels in the middle of the phases and then we'll use a watershed expansion to expand them up into the frontier or the boundary between the phases. Now this was first described I, to my knowledge uh, in a terrific paper by workers at Australian National University. I think it's from Bone 2007. Um, all I remember is I love the paper the first time I read it. Um, Adrian Shepard is uh, one of the co-authors. Uh, Adrian Shepard is an applied mathematician, or at least I think that's, he's in the Department of Applied Math at ANU. He's sort of my image processing hero. Uh, I, was, I was starstruck the first time I met Adrian. And it was even better because he knew who I was. That's so cool when you meet your hero and they know who you are. Anyway, let's get back to Dragonfly. So we are going to segment these high confidence pixels in the middle of each phase and then do a watershed expansion. So I'm gonna uh, dock my probe over here. And what we can do is, um, before we do this, we're actually going to crop the data set so that we can work on a small volume that we can apply and compute in real time during this workshop. If I tried to do the entire uh, 1300 by 600 by 600 pixel, um, it would take maybe maybe 20 minutes on my computer, and I don't want you to stare at a blue progress bar for 20 minutes. So I'm actually going to delete this cell bell, and I'm going to right click on my data in order to crop it. So I'm going to right click and choose crop. And uh, actually all I'm gonna do is just crop out the first 100 slices and we'll, uh, we'll just, yeah, we'll create a new data set. And so now I've got my water flooded and then I have my water flooded cropped. So this is what I will work on. And let's get started by going to tools and we will choose segment, histographic segmentation, here it is. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to generate a 2D scatter plot of our two signals. Now at this point, we only have one signal, the image intensity. I deleted that Sobel image that I had pre-created because uh, for this exercise, this tool will actually create that for you. So on my X axis of this scatter plot, I will use the intensity from the water flooded. Actually, we want the water flooded cropped. And then for the Y axis, it's going to, I can choose anything over here that's the same matrix size or I can have it compute either in 2D or 3D the Sobel filter of that data set. So I'm gonna tell it to compute the histogram. It is going to compute the Sobel image and it'll appear over here. Then it's gonna show us this 2D scatter plot or what I'm calling a histogram, which can be very unexpected or maybe difficult to interpret if you've never seen it before. Now, we're going to be interested in this area down at the bottom where I have low Sobel, so very close to the y equals zero um, axis, or very close to the x axis, very close to y equals zero. Now, this is not very well resolved. This is a low resolution or 128 bin scatter plot. I'm going to tell it to recompute with a 512 bin scatter plot and now it's higher resolution. Now I am still going to uh, use this to zoom in. Actually, I zoomed in a little too far. Let's uh, reset and zoom in and let's get all of this. Now, this is characteristic for what you will see in the histographic segmentation or the 2D scatter plot. What you can expect to see are a peak or a small cluster of pixels at the bottom of the image for each phase. So we have three phases. So we have the pixels that are dark. Those are low intensity on the x-axis, and that's gonna be this cluster right here. Then we have the pixels that are bright, and that's gonna be to the right on the x-axis. And then we have the pixels that are the intermediate phase, in this case, the grains, and that's gonna be those pixels here. Now, if I were just doing a histograph, if I were just using a thresholding operation, I would, if, for example, if I were trying to get the pores that were, you know, four to 6,000 counts, I would just threshold on this interval and it would capture all of these pixels. But we've actually taken the, all those pixels and we've, we've spread them out on the y-axis. So the pixels that are in the middle of a pore 
are the ones down close to y equals zero. The ones that are closer to an interface, they will have an elevated Sobel or they'll have an elevated edge intensity function. What you will find is you have pixels in the middle of a dark pore, pixels in the middle of a grain, and if they are on the interface between the two, then they will have some intensity slightly in between grain and dark pore, and they will have elevated Sobel. So what you'll have is a phase and phase two, and then if there is an interface shared between those two phases, you'll see this arc. So we have phase two and phase three, and we have an arc over here. So this is very customary for what we'll see for a three phase material sample where each of the phases has an interface. So there's also an arc between this and this phase. Now what we can do is we can paint in this domain. So what I have over here is I can define regions of interest. So I can click the plus button three times and I have three phases. So I'm gonna make this a uh, dark blue and I'll, uh, I'll, let's see, this will be our dark pour and then we'll paint the grains and I'll paint the grains uh, an orange and then I'll paint the bright pores uh, yellow. We'll see if, if we have contrast there. Maybe it won't work. We'll try it. Now, I've defined these three regions of interest. If I select this region of interest and then I say in the histogram domain, I wish to paint, that means I can come over here and I can use a control mouse click or mouse drag to paint. And I end up painting every pixel in the image um, who has this position on the scatter plot that has low intensity on the x-axis and low intensity on the y-axis ends up becoming blue. And these are all the pixels in the middle of the dark pore. Now I could do the same thing for the grains. So I could paint here and we see that now we're painting grains and we could paint uh, these pixels which are going to be in the bright white phase. Now bright yellow versus bright white, white it didn't give us much contrast. Maybe if I make it red, it might help a little bit. Yeah, now we can see those. Now I can paint in this domain. I can also expand in this domain. So I could take my blue and say, I wish to take this ROI and dilate in the histogram domain. And so if I click the dilate button, this grows out and it corresponding correspondingly captures more pixels. I can also use this uh, use range and what I could do is I say I want to dilate my blue pixels in the histogram domain but only in this direction if you so choose. So if I click dilate and dilate and dilate I'm getting more and more of the blue pixels and I'm approaching closer to this interface. Now we could do the same thing with the orange phase and we could dilate and we could do the same thing with the red phase and dilate. Now in the red phase you say, well, there are a lot of these pixels that we're not quite capturing. Maybe we need to segment some of those. Well, besides painting in the histogram domain, I can also paint in the image domain. So if I pan and zoom and say, you know, I want to paint in some of these pixels and make sure they get labeled in the red phase. Well, I can come down to the image domain paintbrush and turn it on. And now I can use the control um, hold down control button and move the mouse wheel to make my brush bigger or smaller and then paint. Now as soon as I paint it looks at this, the pixels under this mouse cursor and then it figures out where they are on the scatter plot and then it adds all of those. So you can paint in the image domain and then it enhances your scatter in the scatter domain. So I could again dilate here and now I'm getting a, a, a pretty good coverage. So this allows you to dilate in the histogram domain to have something you like. Now, the preview that you see on screen over here, it's only, uh, it is only previewed for the current views. So if I happen to scroll to another slice uh, in any of these views, I'm not gonna see it, but you could, I think there's a refresh preview. Um, isn't there? Oh, well, here's a refresh preview in the image domain. And so it'll create a preview for the current slice. So if you're satisfied that you have good watershed seeds, then you can come over here and say in the image domain, I'm ready to expand. So we do see expand ROIs. The only algorithm we've developed uh, for doing this expansion is the watershed, but this is extensible. If you have other algorithms that you think would be good for expanding an image domain, we could add those. 
Um, you'll also see over here that besides painting in the histogram domain, we've considered alternate algorithms for selecting these clusters for you. We've tested them and haven't found anything that's really generally useful, but these this is sort of a placeholder for future tools we could create that would help you select your initial seeds. So you can work in the histogram or domain or the image domain. Now we'll just click start and it's going to prompt us what is the landscape function for our watershed expansion. We're just going to use this Sobel image again and then you can use the connectivity 6, 18, or 26. We're just going to use the default and click 6. Now it's going to initiate the watershed, which is going to take a few minutes even on this 100 slice image. So it is taking a bunch of seed regions for my three different phases and then it is expanding them in the landscape function or in that Sobel image domain, expanding them until they converge on those frontiers. So the results you get will depend on how good a coverage you have for the seeds. If you have areas where you have low areas in the Sobel image and you have not created any seeds, then you might not get the results you want. But it's just a good idea to maybe even do a better job than I've done here of spreading the red domain so that you can capture and have uh, leave really only those difficult, hard to segment uh, interface pixels as the only unsegmented pixels. So I now have results over here so I could uh, turn them on and we can see the results of what happens as, as a result of the watershed transform. Now I can close this and now we have uh, the results and we could always, uh, you know, clip or crop them. I think I made a cylinder in my, in my organizer so I could grab the cylinder and bring it over here. And I could say, let's use the cylinder to mask the blue domain, for example. So I could right click and say, mask ROI one, and now it removes all of those pixels out there. So that is the histographic segmentation. It's used for material and geological samples. We have multiple phases and you want to label the core that is the unambiguous pixels in the middle of your phases and then use a watershed to expand. So that's really all you need to know about the histographic segmentation. And we're gonna go ahead and switch over to questions and answers now. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you are interested in bone research or you're a bone imaging scientist, then stick around till the end. So questions and answers, let's see what's in the queue. All right, someone has making a comment that he is interested in users groups, like to hear about uh, cutting edge image processing technology. That would be a terrific topic. If you have some suggestions for what we could do in Dragonfly users groups, either in-person meetings or virtual meetings where you can learn more about Dragonfly or learn more about what other imaging scientists are doing with Dragonfly, send me an email message to mmarshattheobjects.com and give me your suggestion. We'd like to maybe do some of those and get more engaged with our customer base. So I'm gonna go on to the next question. Do you have have a ring artifact filter or this must always be done before reconstruction. Uh, we have a ring artifact filter. Um, I think it has a limited range of use cases so it might work on your data, it might not. Um, and I believe it is, I think you can just search for the word ring in the image filtering toolbox. However, ring artifacts are present because the intensity in your projection images has non-uniform response across the pixels of your detector and therefore some pixels will be constantly reporting slightly brighter or darker signal than they should be and if you look at those pixels and then you do a reconstruction they will appear at a constant radius and that will introduce a ring artifact. The best way to correct ring artifacts is to correct that non-uniform response function in the projection domain or in the sinogram domain before you do a reconstruction. So that's not to say you can't do correction after it has been reconstructed. It is just better to do correction before it has been reconstructed. Next question, is it possible to use histographic segmentation to create a multiroy of, for example, individual grains? Well, you could do that. I mean, you could take the segmentation and then you could uh, split out the, the ROIs and then do a connected components analysis. Now, in this case, the grains are all kind of cemented together, but, oh, and this is not even a multi-ROI. It's already an individual ROI of the grains. We see the grains are, are heavily cemented together. If you wanted to separate these grains, you could look, there is a YouTube video on how to do that in Dragonfly. You can just Google watershed Dragonfly distance and because it applies the watershed transform on a distance map and does exactly that, separates out those grains. That could be a topic for a daily. 
Um, next question, do you need to segment all the phases or can you choose only one? Will histographic segmentation work? The watershed will expand all the way until it hits another ROI. And so if you are doing that, it's going to overwrite certain pixels of the image. I shouldn't use the word overwrite. It's going to label all the pixels of the image. So it's going to do over segment what you want. So you probably want to have an ROI for each different representative phase. Although in Dragonfly, there is a way to invoke the watershed transform and, and use a spatial mask. So if you define a mask and say, I'm only interested in labeling these pixels and not these other pixels, then you can constrain the watershed expansion. And uh, I'll just mention that if you have to have a multi-ROI, so if I had, uh, we'll just put these two into a multi-ROI. If I have a multi-ROI, I right click and there is a watershed transform option here. Uh, you must first choose a landscape function and then the second parameter is choose a mask and then it will not invoke the watershed or expand those ROIs beyond the bounds of whatever you choose as a mask. But you could always choose no mask. So you do have that option. Now the next question, have you got a timeline for the next few weeks of the Dragonfly Daily? Um, so yeah, we mentioned that at the top of the hour. I think we're going to do a little more on segmentation tomorrow and then I think we're going to move into macros and Python development and customization next week and then move on to some applications. So uh, if you have not been catching the Dragonfly Daily from the very beginning each day, these are sort of the topics that we have left to cover that I've thought of so far. So we could, of course, talk about watershed transform and distance mapping, uh, cylinder transforms or something I call soup can wrapper. You could, we could add these to the image processing agenda and then we could uh, talk about 40 data, talk about connecting to the infinite toolbox. And then we have applications that people are very interested in. These are going to take a little longer. I might set us up so that we do the Dragonfly daily for another two or three weeks. And then maybe we switch to a once a week so that we have time to develop longer content and do a once a week webinar on these applications. So we might do something like that. Um, but no specific agenda um, with a daily, no daily schedule that I can give you at this time. I'm going to go back to present mode so that I can pull my captions back on. All right, next question. Do you, I answered that question. Do you have advice on how to deal with beam hardening, uh, cupping, and do a clean segmentation? Well, so there are a couple of things that you could do. So I would recommend that you try segmenting with deep learning and you label some pixels from the middle of the image and some pixels from the high periphery of the image or high radius where you have the beam hardening. You can also in Dragonfly provide multiple images as input to your segmentation. That means you could have a distance map as input. And what Dragonfly's deep learning engine could do is instead of evaluating simply the image intensity, it could also examine the distance from the center of the image or the distance from the edge, which might be a better solution. And if it has that as one of its signals for the deep learning, then it could learn that when it encounters a phase near the edge, it needs to look for depressed intensities or actually in the case of cupping, there should be elevated intensities near the edge. Um, if you've done a beam hardening correction and you've overcompensated, then you may have depressed intensities at the, at the edge. So I would do that for doing beam hardening correction. Um, of course, uh, what we would like to see in the future is better CT reconstruction engines that understand the physics of polychromatic lamps and take that into account in the reconstruction. But uh, that's for another discussion on another day. Uh, can we go deeper into the watershed? So yeah, we could add that as a topic. And so I think we'll, we'll probably add that as an image processing topic um, here in the next week or two. Um, next question. Uh, if I have an image with soil grains, which all have different intensities, will this procedure work? Well, if you have a fixed number of grains, like let's say you have seven different intensities, then you'll see seven different little clusters on the bottom of your histogram. And so you can paint each one. If your image resolution cannot see individual grains and you have partial volume effects where you just have a continuous blur of intensities from bright to dark, then this won't work. But also you're just going to have a fundamental segmentation problem if every pixel is some combination of grains. But if you have, uh, you know, five or seven or even 15 different grain intensities, if they are well resolved, and that is each grain is, uh, is uniform and represented in, in multiple copies across your image domain, then yes, this technique will work. 
All right, um, next question. Uh, that's all the questions. All right, so thank you all for your attention, and we'll be back with the Dragonfly Daily tomorrow at the same time. So have a great day, everybody.